uh, happy to be here. Um, so, okay, so hello everyone. Uh, today I will be talking about a project that I worked on uh, as part of my work with Data Pop Alliance. Uh, so this project is uh, about using non-traditional data sources uh, in order to analyze the development challenges faced by Syrian refugees and host communities in Lebanon. Uh, in the presentation today, I'll be focused mainly on uh, two of the sources that we used, which were called detail records and sentiment analysis. Uh, so this project was in collaboration with the United Nations Economic and Social Commission of Western Asia, which is based in, uh, headquartered in Beirut. Uh, in addition to uh, partnering with the Qatar Computing Research Institute, uh, uh, which is part of the Hamad bin Khalifa University in Qatar. Uh, so uh, for this so for this presentation today, I will be uh, first giving a little bit of context about the situation uh, and the refugee situation in Lebanon. Uh, next, we will take a look at the human development outcomes uh, that we uh, aimed to target in this project. Uh, we will take a look a little bit on the general approach and the methodology that we followed. Uh, uh, we will also look at the data sources that we used uh, and we will focus, as I said, on the call detail records and on media and social media sentiment analysis, uh, the approach and the results. And at the end, we will take a look at some discussions, limitations and lessons learned. So uh, to begin with a little bit of context, uh, so Lebanon has the most Syrian refugees per capita in the world uh, with 1.5 million Syrian refugees uh, out of a total population of uh, 6 million, which also includes uh, pa Palestinian refugees. Uh, so the challenges that the refugees face, of course, the refugees have their own challenges, uh, but in addition to the challenges that are faced in the host communities, uh, these add more impact on the refugees themselves and on their lives and the funding for the for UNHCR to perform surveys uh, about the conditions of the Syrian refugees has remained more or less the same while the challenges have increased uh, as we know we have a global pandemic and as many people already know we have an economic and political crisis in Lebanon uh, so the challenges have been increasing uh, which might mean that the funding gap has been increasing uh, so data collection is of course needed but the regular traditional data collection collection of census and surveys and so on uh, the process is expensive and is it is time consuming which is why in this project we aim to explore cost effective ways to produce more insights uh, by using uh, uh, big data and using the traditional data sources. So uh, the non-traditional data sources were actually used not to replace the traditional data sources but to complement them. So as I said, uh, we're subject to the context of the refugee crisis and the crises, the many crises that are happening in Lebanon right now. Uh, this project uh, took place in, in 2020, which uh, means it faced uh, uh, the economic crisis, the political crisis, uh, the explosion that happened in Beirut. So all the more, uh, and in addition to the pandemic, of course, so all the more reasons uh, to need data quickly and to be cautious when uh, taking the uh, when the using these data uh, to make sure that we don't violate the privacy of the uh, of the people and so on so this will take a look at it towards the end uh, but this was taken into consideration of course uh, and the explored human development outcomes that we aimed to target in this project uh, were uh, to get as much as possible up-to-date statistics uh, as opposed to regular census. So uh, these statics, statistics would include the population pyramid, so age and gender distribution, uh, the refugee distribution in Lebanon, so where are the refugees mostly concentrated, the mobility patterns, so the movement of the Syrian refugees in time and space uh, from which district to which district and so on within Lebanon, in addition to the border movement, so the frequency of them, of the Syrian refugees leaving Lebanon or coming into Lebanon, uh, in addition to the economic activities of both uh, the Syrian refugees and host communities uh, within the different branches of economy, formal work versus informal work and so on. 
Uh, in addition to the health status, so their access, their access of the refugees to health services uh, and the school enrollment and the levels of education and so on. Uh, and finally, uh, security, so reported and observed, observed incidents, uh, sentiment towards the refugees and sentiments toward the conditions of the refugees uh, and so on. So most of these outcomes, we were able to cover them in the project. Uh, some of them were covered by data sources that we will not be talking about in this presentation, but most of these uh, outcomes were covered by the data sources that we will be discussing today. So uh, as a summary, the approach is to use non-traditional data sources and to use them to predict and also to complement traditional data sources. So with the combination of uh, non-traditional data sources and traditional data sources, the final aim is to be able to get traditional insights uh, such as demographics and poverty and economics and so on. And the non-traditional insights such as sentiment uh, towards the refugees, connectedness of the refugees uh, and so on. So uh, the methodology that we followed uh, for this project was the following. So what we first did was we gathered traditional data from the traditional sources and non-traditional data from non-traditional sources. We created simple indicators from the non-traditional data sources, and we also extracted simple indicators from the traditional sources. And then we, we performed descriptive analysis uh, statistics, and we used simple machine learning models that show how covariates from the non-traditional data sources explain the changes in the traditional sources, uh, of course, related to the living conditions such as economics and so on. And we reported all the results uh, by using by testing out of sample predictions. So the data sources that we used in this project uh, were two types, the traditional and the non-traditional. So the traditional data sources that were used as references, uh, or we can also say they were the y-axis for the machine learning model. So they were the UNHCR uh, vulnerability assessment of Syrian refugees, uh, hereafter referred to as Vazir. So this is an annual uh, assessment that the UNHCR in Lebanon uh, performs about the conditions of the Syrian refugees. So this is a traditional survey that is performed by UNHCR. Uh, and we also take, uh, we also use the Lebanese Central Administration of Statistics. Uh, so the official statistics administration here in Lebanon, uh, they have performed in 2018 uh, a survey that they called the Labor Force and Household Conditions Survey, which there's, they surveyed the conditions of the, uh, the Lebanese population. And we refer to it in this presentation as the CAS LFS. So these are the traditional sources that we used and the non-traditional sources that we used were the call detail records, uh, uh, GDELT or the global database of events, language and tone, uh, Twitter. And we also in the project used a Facebook advertising platform. This was actually performed by our partners, Q QCRI. Uh, as I said, they worked with us on this project, but uh, we will not be exploring their part of the work in the presentation. So starting off with the call detail records or CDRs, uh, so uh, we requested uh, from uh, the two telecom operations and operators in Lebanon. So we have two telecom operators in Lebanon, Alpha and Touch. We requested from them uh, that uh, the call detail records of uh, Lebanese population and uh, the Syrian refugees, if they allow this type of uh, differentiation uh, between uh, the regular users and the Syrian refugee users. So we requested data from both telecom operators. Uh, so the data that we received, we we had a total number of sites, uh, of call sites uh, from Alpha, a total of 455 sites and a total of 341 cells from touch. Uh, so the calls that we received were the total number of incoming calls, total number of outgoing calls, uh, the duration of incoming and the duration of outgoing calls, and the mobile data consumption. Uh, that data was for the years of 2016 to 2019. Some of the data was aggregated to a daily level, some was aggregated to a monthly level, and some was aggregated to a yearly level. Uh, uh, for all these years and for all the data, they were for the months of April, May, and June, which is also the months when uh, uh, UNHCR 
uh, collects the data for Vazir, which is why we picked these three months in particular. And for two governorates in Lebanon, these two governorates are where uh, the Syrian refugees are mostly concentrated. And these two governorates in total consist of 12 districts. Uh, and as I said, we uh, requested differentiation between Syrian refugees uh, calls and uh, regular users calls. So uh, Touch, which is one of the telecom uh, operators, they have a special line for Syrian refugees called Al Tawasul. Uh, so it has features to connect to uh, Syria and special calls and minutes to Syria. So we differentiate where we can between Al Tawasul users and non Al Tawasul users. So we ended up with a good a number of, of total calls per year for both uh, regular users and uh, uh, Al-Tawasul users. So the total number of calls for all uh, types of users was about 300 million. And out of these calls, we had about 1 million uh, calls for Al-Tawasul users. So uh, as I said, not all data sets are aggregated in the same manner, which uh, caused a little bit of limitations uh, as the work went on. And the calculated outcomes that we calculated out of these uh, records, so they were all also aggregated to a district level. So uh, we were dealing with aggregated data. So it also a little bit limited what we could do, but we were still able to calculate some good outcomes. Uh, so these consisted of the residence distribution. So in these two dist uh, governorates that we have, how are the people, the population distributed in these governorates? So this was calculated by the total number of calls of the district divided by the total number of calls of the governorate. This was calculated on an annual level. And then we calculated the annual mobility uh, uh, distribution of the users. So this was by uh, calculated for each year as the current or the uh, residence distribution for that year minus the, that of the previous year divided by the previous year. So uh, this would uh, vary from uh, negative to positive to, to describe the uh, increase in the population in a given district versus the decrease in the population of, of a given district. We also calculated the population pyramids as the calls per age per gender. Uh, we also took a look at the border movement. So uh, Al-Tawasul calls uh, their variation across the years. So have they been increasing or decreasing and so on? And we also take a look at the ec economic activities by calculating uh, ratios of the numbers of calls and the durations of calls. So uh, dividing the total number of outgoing calls by the incoming calls and the duration as well. And we also uh, take a look at the mobile data uh, upload and download and total consumption and the ratios of this uh, mobile data. And we also take a look at the security. Uh, so the intensity of the population or the concentration of the population uh, based on the density of the sites and the, uh, the numbers of uh, cells uh, per district or as we call them in Lebanon, Qada uh, or Qaza. So uh, for the first... Uh, so for the first uh, indicator that we calculated, that was the population distribution. Uh, so we performed the, a simple linear regression of the uh, uh, population indicator as calculated by the CDRs uh, compared to uh, the population distribution as per uh, the uh, CAS LFS um, survey that we discussed earlier. So we ended up with an R2 score of 0 0.9 and a mean squared error of 0 0.001. Uh, so this is for 12 districts. As we can see, we have 12 data points and we have the uh, linear regression line. So uh, this was for the population distribution. Uh, and we also performed some Pearson correlations. So for the population indicator from the first uh, a telecom operator that we have, we have a Pearson correlation of 0 0.95. From the second telecom operator that we have, which is Touch, we have a, tot uh, a Pearson correlation of 0 0.88. And the number of cells, comparing the number of cells of Touch uh, uh, with the with the population distribution, we have a Pearson correlation of 0 0.89. And for the number of sites from the second uh, a telecom operator, we have a Pearson correlation of 0 0.81. 
So this is in terms of the population distribution. Uh, as for the annual mobility patterns, so uh, as we said, we calculated uh, the annual mobility patterns as a percentage of the variation that varies from negative to positive. So we take a look here in this graph at, at, at an example of the variation of the annual mobility in one of the uh, districts in Lebanon. So we can see that there was an increase by approximately 5% in 2017, followed by a decrease in, uh, in 5% in 2018. So at the same time, uh, what was happening in this district was that in 2017, there was an increase in the Syrian refugees, which led to the residents protesting this increase in the Syrian refugees. Whereas in 2018, uh, uh, there was a mass eviction of the Syrian refugees in the Lebanese uh, municipalities, including Pshare, uh, which is the one in this graph, after the murder of a woman by a Syrian refugee in a neighboring uh, municipality. So we're not saying that the, uh, that the annual mobility patterns uh, is because of this uh, mass eviction. But this happened at the same time. So at the same time, there was an increase in the refugees. There was an increase in the annual mobility. And at the same time, there was a decrease in the uh, in the population. Because of the mass eviction, there was a decrease in the annual mobility uh, in our data. We also performed uh, a le simple linear regression between one of the between uh, between one of the um, indicators that we calculated so the duration ratio uh, that we discussed earlier compared to the uh, uh, to one of the vazir indicators that is relevant to uh, the economical situation of the refugees so the percentage of families that have uh, a high debt so we can see that uh, as the duration uh, increases, the uh, that uh, the percentage of the families in uh, the debt group that is greater than six hundred dollars uh, uh, decreases. And we also uh, performed multivariate regression with multiple uh, features uh, compared compared with the labor force participation rate, and we also uh, ca calculated. Uh, uh, multivariate regression with also about two features uh, compared to. Uh, the percentage families with that. So we performed uh, multivariate regression against uh, the traditional data for uh, the host communities and also for the uh, Syrian refugees data. Uh, and uh, in terms of security, so we performed Pearson correlation between the uh, population indicators that we had uh, versus the Vazir security indicators. So uh, Vazir had a couple of questions that are related to uh, facing uh, issues that the uh, or the Syrian refugees facing issues related to security in their areas. So we could see a positive Pearson correlation of about 0 0.7 uh, between the population indicator and the uh, security indicators. So the higher the security indicators, also the higher the population uh, indicator in that same district. Uh, we also plotted the variation of the percentage of the refugees in the CDRs. So when we calculate the percentage of refugees in the CDRs, and we also calculate the percentage of the refugees according to uh, the, the data from UNHCR. And we can see that for both uh, graphs, we can see that there is a decrease from 2013, uh, 2017 up until 2019. So we can see that both graphs are decreasing uh, with CDR slightly it's decreasing in a stronger manner rather than the uh, Vazir uh, graph. But nonetheless, both are decreasing. And we also plotted the box plot of the activity of the Syrian refugees, uh, of their activity of weekends versus weekdays versus holidays. So we could see uh, that the holidays, that they actually have an increased uh, calls during the holidays as opposed to weekdays and weekends, with weekdays and weekends uh, acting a little bit similarly. And as we know, uh, uh, not much of a variation between uh, call activity and holidays versus weekdays for, versus weekends might suggest uh, informal work as opposed to a regular nine to five job uh, and formal work. Uh, so this is it uh, for in terms of the indicators that we calculated using CDRs. So next we take a look at the media and social media sentiment analysis. So for the media sentiment analysis, we make use of GDELT, which is the global database 
is of events, language, and tone. Uh, so this database is supported by Google Jigsaw. And what it does is that it monitors the world's broadcast, print, and web news. And it extracts from these uh, news uh, the links and the source URL and the sentiment, uh, the locations, and the uh, types of the people involved. So what we did is that we extracted from uh, this database uh, uh, articles reporting about different topics taking place specifically in Lebanon and involving Syrian refugees and Lebanese uh, population. So we made sure that we have both types of actors in the extracted data. Uh, and GDALT already provides sentiment analysis for uh, the English articles that varies from minus one negative to plus one positive, uh, but it didn't provide at the time for the Arabic uh, sentiment analysis. So we used an open source uh, Arabic sentiment analysis API called Mazajak that labels the text at, as either positive, negative or neutral. Uh, so as we can see from this graph, uh, the, this shows the variation of the sentiment of the articles about Syrian refugees in general taking place in Lebanon across the years from 2016 to 2019. We can see a general decrease in the sentiment of uh, in the English articles and also an increase in the percentage of the articles that are uh, negative in, Ar in Arabic. So we have a general decrease in the sentiment. We also, out of these articles that are about the Syrian refugees, we take a look at the ones that mention employment and the ones that mention incidents and so on. So Syrian refugees in the context of employment and Syrian refugees in the context of uh, incidents. And we can see that uh, there is also a decrease in the sentiment and there is also an increase in the percentage of negative articles uh, in Arabic uh, for both uh, employment and incidents and also for shelters. So we can see that there's, there's a general uh, trend uh, towards uh, negativity about the conditions of the Syrian refugees or uh, the incidents that are taking place or their shelters. And we also uh, take a look at the articles that are about the returns of the Syrian refugees. So many political parties in Lebanon have uh, and uh, uh, they have been mentioning the return of Syrian refugees and whether they want the refugees to return uh, and how to, to ensure that they return safely to, to Syria and so on. So we also take a look at that. And similarly to what we did with the regular media that we accessed uh, through GDALT, we also take a look at social media and specifically Twitter. Uh, so we extracted the tweets for the years of interest as well. We used a Twitter premium, which allows uh, 500 tweets per query. And for each topic that we have of interest, so whether incidents, uh, employment, uh, and so on, uh, we perform requests in Arabic and in English in order to uh, extract tweets about Syrian refugees and the, the total sample that we looked at uh, towards the end is about 4,400 articles, uh, uh, tweets, sorry, about the Syrian refugees uh, and the Syrian refugees within the topics of interest, so whether employment uh, and so on. Uh, but t Twitter did not allow geographical segregation on uh, these tweets. So while we, while we were able to associate uh, the GDALT articles with the exact locations where they happened, we were unable to do that with Twitter. Uh, nonetheless, we were still able to take a look at the variation of the sentiment towards the Syrian refugees uh, uh, in, in Twitter. And we have generally more negative sentiment in Arabic uh, rather than uh, negative sentiment in English. Uh, and so the, this is it in terms of the sources that we used and the approach and so on. Uh, so uh, we'll take a look about uh, at a little bit of dis uh, discussions. So uh, the aim of this project was to uh, incorporate non-traditional data sources with the work of the traditional data sources. So we're not aiming to replace traditional sources and senses, uh, but non-traditional sources are supposed to help uh, the traditional sources since they are less uh, time consuming and easier to collect and they cover uh, more, more of the population and more details as well. Uh, they are also also much faster and cheaper to collect. So that's why we suggest to use them uh, as a help to the traditional data sources. Uh, 
And the findings of this project, while we were unable to get uh, more granular details, but the findings of this project were consistent with, consistent with the studies that we uh, reviewed before taking uh, this project. Uh, so uh, bo even though we were at a higher granularity, we were able to show the potential of non-traditional data sources uh, for the demographic and uh, economic analysis. Uh, and of course, increasing the gr granularity uh, can provide better assessment for this uh, potential in Lebanon. And among the advantages of these data sources uh, in this context is their ability to be updated at a higher frequency than traditional data sources. And they could be in near real time, as we saw Twitter scraping and GDELT uh, are provided in near real time. Uh, and uh, call detail records should be also available near real time. And the sources that we used in this project uh, were used to predict some indicators that are relevant to some SDGs, uh, particularly ending uh, poverty and the full and productive employment and decent work for all. Uh, and the call detail records that we saw predicted economic abilities, uh, formal versus informal work, unemployment and employment percentages for both refugees and host communities, and the non-traditional data sources uh, if used correctly, they could provide the policymakers with insights about the current status towards achieving these SDGs, and they could be used in that context. And uh, so next for the lessons that we learned in this project. Uh, so we learned that CDRs can easily amount to terabytes wealth of information about social behavior, uh, which has been shown to correlate with socioeconomic and demographic indicators. And the amount of, uh, of information that can be derived from this data source uh, has to be balanced with the protection of privacy. So we need to make sure that we do not violate the privacy of the individuals that we are uh, uh, doing the analysis on. So, for example, what we did in this project was that we had uh, data aggregated to a district level so we could not uh, and, uh, be directed towards any individual uh, and individual because we're not actually accessing uh, information about these particular users. We're rather working with aggregated data to a district level and sometimes to a governorate level. Uh, and one additional uh, thing that we uh, tested out a little bit, but we couldn't uh, uh, much report the results of it. So what we could do is to combine the indicators that are gathered from the different data sources. So we calculated indicators from call detail records. We calculated indicators from social media sentiment analysis and our partners uh, at QCRI calculated indicators from Facebook. So we could combine all of these indicators together uh, and work on a multivariate uh, model that uh, predicts that increases the model's ability to predict the target values and the values of interest. Uh, however, we would require for that a larger sample. And since we were working with only uh, 12 data points uh, for each year, we couldn't um, uh, perform this kind of analysis. So we would need a larger sample uh, to perform this kind of analysis. So due to the aggregated nature of the data, we could not use a complex model uh, in order to avoid uh, the risk of overfitting the model on the data that we had. Uh, and lastly, so in order to ensure that uh, the, the project has been uh, working ethically with the data, uh, we uh, had a code meeting, so a council and orientation for the development and ethics meeting. Uh, so for that meeting, we uh, at DPA, we attended it, and our partners, UN Esqua and QCRI, attended it as well. Uh, we also uh, had uh, the Central Administration of, of Statistics, uh, some members from the American University of Beirut, uh, the Ministry of Telecommunications in Lebanon, and UNDP. So what we did in that meeting is we discussed the data protection, uh, so we agreed on the level of the aggregation and we made sure uh, that the data that we used, the call detail records, uh, were used in an offline PC. They were not shared by email or on a drive link or whatsoever. They were uh, the entire time on an offline PC and they were destroyed once we were done with the, with the project. 
and we also uh, uh, used publicly available data for, so for the traditional sources we used the publicly available indicators that were available on the websites of the uh, people who performed the surveys uh, we also took into account that there will be bias in these kinds of uh, data so not everyone has mobile phones not all the uh, not all the uh, refugees have mobile phones or uh, a report on Twitter what the, what has been going on with them so uh, we do understand that there is is an underrepresentation of certain group, groups, which is why we say that we do not replace the traditional data sources with the non-traditional data sources. We're only uh, uh, using the non-traditional to complement the ground truth. And we also acknowledged uh, uh, the fact that uh, there could be intended and unintended uses of the data. So. Uh, we acknowledge the fact that this might happen, but in our case, uh, we did not. We made sure that the data was privately held and that uh, it was not used in an unintentional uh, source, and uh, everything was clearly uh, explained in the write-up process. Uh, and yes, this is uh, it basically for this project. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this event. Uh, and yeah.